In the smoky aftermath of an era marked by wealth and luxury, where fortunes were forged and dreams were dashed at the whims of unseen powerful figures, one name dominated larger than the grandest skyscraper of his time. Picture a man who held in his grasp the strings of unimaginable wealth, influence, and power shaping the very destiny of a nation. This mysterious figure, known as J.P. Morgan, was more than a mere mortal. He was a master puppeteer, pulling the strings that could either rescue a floundering empire or cast it into the abyss with but a single, inscrutable glance. But who exactly was J.P. Morgan? Join us as we dive into his story. Challenging Beginnings on April 17, 1837, John Pierpont Morgan was born into a privileged family in Connecticut. His paternal grandfather, Joseph, was one of the founders of the Aetna Insurance Company. His father, Junius Spencer Morgan, had achieved success as a banker before marrying Juliet Pierpont, the daughter of the renowned minister and poet John Pierpont. Junius ensured that his son John received the finest education money could buy. He understood the importance of grooming John to follow in his footsteps as a financier. This exposed Exposure to the world of finance provided John with a solid foundation for all his future endeavors. Although he was born into a privileged family, Pierpont's childhood was far from fortunate. Afflicted with various health issues including seizures, severe coughing fits, and other unfathomable ailments, he was confined to his home for extended periods, unable to socialize with friends or peers. In the solace of his indoor confines, he found solace in reading. However, his life took a drastic turn when he was struck with rheumatic fever, which left him paralyzed. To aid in his recovery, his father, Junius Spencer Morgan, decided to relocate him to a remote island called Azor in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, where he lived in isolation without any familial or friendly company. Junius believed that the island's climate and salty air would assist his son's recuperation. After regaining his health, Pierpont's interest in the arts was ignited through his frequent visits to galleries and concerts with his parents. This passion for artistic expression would remain with him for the rest of his life. While he initially displayed disinterest in academics, his dedication and commitment to his studies improved over time, leading to noticeable improvements in his grades during his attendance at English High School in Boston. In 1854, Junius Morgan relocated his family to London so he could embark on his new career as a partner at the banking firm of George Peabody & Co. Meanwhile, Pierpont, at a young age, was sent to an institute in the town of Seelig in Switzerland, where he not only became proficient in French, but also showcased a natural talent for mathematics. He attended Göttingen University in Germany, entering the workforce at the age of 19. Thanks to his father's influence, Pierpont secured a job at the banking firm responsible for managing George Peabody & Co's interests in America. His responsibilities included writing detailed reports about the political and financial landscape in the developing American market. Upon completing his education in 1857, Morgan relocated to New York to work as a clerk at Duncan Sherman & Co, the American division of his father's firm. You see, from a young age, John's father had concerns about his son's volatile nature, believing it would hinder his chances of succeeding as a financier. In an effort to instill self-discipline and responsibility, John's father urged him to learn these traits. This led to a display of John's resourcefulness when he was in New Orleans for business and met a ship captain who had a surplus of coffee with no buyer. John cleverly used his company's funds to purchase the coffee and then sold it to local merchants, resulting in a profit. This achievement gave him the confidence to venture out on his own. Although he still maintained a relationship with his father by working at J. Pierpont Morgan & Co., which he established in the early 1860s. Aware of his father's aversion to such risks, John decided to join an established firm in 1861, seeking safety and security. Nonetheless, he later founded his own company and continued to serve as an agent for his father's bank in England. Additionally, during that same year, John grew close to influential individuals in his New York social circle. Morgan developed a close bond with the Amelia Sturges, who happened to be the daughter of a prosperous merchant. Their relationship flourished until it faced an immense setback in 1861 when Amelia was diagnosed with tuberculosis. Despite this unfortunate circumstance, their love for each other only grew stronger, leading them to tie the knot. In the hope of accelerating Amelia's recovery, John took her on a honeymoon in the Mediterranean, drawing inspiration from a similar experience that had benefited him during his youth. 
Unfortunately, the attempt proved futile, and in February 1862, Amelia tragically succumbed to the disease. John, consumed by grief, became a mere shadow of his former self, seemingly unable to find solace or recover from his loss. Immersing himself in his work in 1864, prompted by his father, he collaborated with Charles Dabney, a seasoned partner, to establish Dabney, Morgan & Co. With Junius Morgan now leading the London banking firm, the Morgans actively expanded their wealth and influence by directing investment from overseas into American enterprises. Meanwhile, Pierpont found love once again, this time with Frances Louisa, the daughter of a renowned New York lawyer. Their relationship blossomed, which led to a marital union between Pierpont and Frances in May 1865. Over time, the couple had four children, including a son whom Pierpont named John Pierpont Morgan Jr., affectionately known as Jack Morgan Jr. It was clear that Jack would eventually follow in his father's footsteps and take over the family business. As the years went by, Morgan saw a significant change upon the retirement of his partner Dabney in 1871. Seizing the opportunity, Morgan teamed up with Anthony Drexel, a respected Philadelphia banker, to establish Drexel, Morgan & Co. This new venture set up its headquarters in a grand, towering building in Lower Manhattan. By his mid-30s, Morgan's stature in the financial world was growing, characterized by his imposing physical presence, penetrating eyes, and no-nonsense demeanor. In 1879, Morgan's career reached new heights when Williams Vanderbilt approached him with the proposition to sell 250,000 shares of stock in the New York Central Railroad. Without causing any significant decline in the share price, Morgan successfully oversaw this monumental transaction, further solidifying his already made career. As a demonstration of his influence in the industry, in 1885, Morgan organized a meeting on his yacht, the Corsair, between the conflicting directors of the New York Central and Pennsylvania Railroad. This meeting showcased Morgan's ability to bring peace between two warring parties, proffer resolutions, and promote cooperation. The extent of Morgan's power became evident during the aftermath of the Panic of 1893. As the U.S. gold reserves faced a significant depletion, Morgan took decisive action by forming an international syndicate of investors who were willing to provide gold in exchange for favorable 30-year bonds. To alleviate President Glover Cleveland's skepticism, Morgan referred to an often overlooked 1862 statute that granted the Secretary of the Treasury the authority to execute such a transaction without requiring congressional approval. This display of financial maneuvering showcased Morgan's ability to navigate complex legal frameworks and exercise influential control during times of economic crisis. The syndicate bought and snappily resold the bonds in early 1895, stabilizing the shaky frugality. Following the death of Drexel that time, Pierpont again reorganized his company into J.P. Morgan & Co. The establishment soon became a major player in the sword assiduity by financing the confirmation of Federal Steel in 1898. Three times latterly, after copying Andrew Carnegie's sword company for nearly $500 million, Morgan intermingled the realities into U.S. Steel, creating the first billion-dollar enterprise. In 1901, Morgan teamed with James J. Hill to form the Northern Securities Company. Northern Securities held the maturity of shares in the Northern Pacific, the Great Northern, and the CB and Q roads, giving Morgan control of roughly one-third of the country's railroads. Still, President Theodore Roosevelt opposed opposed his sweats and tried to use the populist movement against the fat elite American called J.P. Morgan. He faced resistance from President Roosevelt, who wanted to use the growing public sentiment against the fat purloiner tycoons to his advantage. In 1902, the Justice Department took legal action against Northern Securities, incriminating them of violating the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890. After a long legal battle, the Supreme Court eventually ruled in favor of the government in 1904. Nonetheless, J.P. Morgan continued to apply his influence in both diligence and government. In 1903, his company, J.P. Morgan, was appointed as the financial agent for the recently independent Republic of Panama. Their liabilities included overseeing the transfer of $40 million to the new Panama Canal Company. Although Morgan achieved great success, he still faced review. Certain individuals claimed that he established monopolies and wielded expansive control over pivotal diligence. In addition, others asserted that his conduct had negative goods on lower challengers and workers. The conversations regarding his business practices stressed the intricate nature and moral predicaments of his reign. In 1907, Morgan again was called to prop the U.S. government in the grips of profitable fear. Seeking to stabilize a series of collapsing trust banks, he called several bank chairpersons to his Manhattan library, and in an echo of his freebooter meeting of 1885, locked the door until a result could be reached. After all-night accommodations went nowhere, Morgan ended the stalemate by drawing up a bailout contract and ordering the exhausted chairpersons to subscribe. Death and legacy. 
Morgan set passage on an overseas passage after the sounds, but his health steadily declined, and he failed at a hostel in Rome, Italy on March 31, 1913. To commemorate his end, the New York Stock Exchange remained unrestricted until noon on the day of his burial. After his death, John's son took over the business and continued the expansion. As a matter of fact, in our world moment, a lot of people still see the banking sector as one of the most important. JP Morgan will be proud of his son. Morgan's astounding success converted the fiscal assiduity and left behind an important heritage. Although he doubly bailed out the US Treasury, his capability to do so left numerous unsettled, prodding the creation of the Federal Reserve System in late 1913. His name lives on through the massive transnational banking establishment he created, which entered the 21st century as J.P. Morgan Chase & Company. While Morgan was an incredibly successful businessman who was loved by many, he also faced criticism and controversy. Many saw him as too powerful, exerting undue influence over politics and the economy. Some accused him of forming monopolies and exploiting workers. These debates and criticisms shed light on the complex nature of Morgan's legacy, highlighting both his considerable achievements and the ethical questions surrounding his business practices. There may never be another individual quite akin to JP Morgan. This was his story. What are your thoughts on JP Morgan's impact? Let me know in the comments below and don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel for more intriguing episodes. Thanks for watching.